Bill, kind of hate to see the old thing come down. Been well, hanging there ever since the alumni club gave it to us. That was for our 15th anniversary. That's a long time ago. Yes, you're telling me. <laughs> you know, I don't mind removing it, though. We haven't any other place to put our new Grandma Moses print. Well, I guess that's true. That's the last argument. But let me be nostalgic once in a while. Oh, well, Howard, really, I don't blame you. You know, with all the things you've collected about America and her art, so you can be nostalgic. Yes. Uh, well, before we bust out in tears, let's hang the new print. Okay. Well, Howard, tell me something about this charming thing. It is nice, isn't it? Oh, yes. One of Grandma Moses' earliest paintings. She called it the checkered house. And you know, for a gal that didn't start painting until she was 78, she didn't do so badly. Mm -hmm. No. So it, it, it just looks so natural and all quiet and, well, really sort of primitive. Good choice of words, Esther. It was a return to primitive painting. Well, let's hang it. I'm anxious to see it. Okay. I think these new catches will hold it all right. Well, I hope so. <laughs> you know, that other there. one was always and forever falling down. Yes, I know. You know, every time a truck went there, by. Now, let's see. Now. Okay. Say, now that looks that very... That's great, no? Oh, you know, I like that. It looks nice there. Much uh -huh. nicer than this thing. Oh, well, now, woman, how can you speak so disparagingly of the sinking of the good ship Merrimack? <laughs> well, this is going to be thoroughly sunk this time, believe me. Well... Suppose you want me to save the frame, though. Well, by all means, you can at least <laughs> save the frame. Oh, well, all right. Uh, I don't know what Esther doesn't like about that old Merrimack print, but you can't always outfigure a woman anyway. <clears throat> I kind of like that uh, Grandma Moses painting we just hung, don't you? And she was painting at just about the time I'd like to talk to you about. Uh, right after the Second World War. A really big period of adjustment. Let's just stop and think a moment about the years 1945 through 1950. We had a new president, Harry Truman. We had the atom bomb and the hydrogen bomb and VE Day and VJ Day, demobilization, formation of the United Nations, and labor strikes and inflation and shortages. We had the 80th Congress with the Republican Party thoroughly controlling both houses and the Democratic Party in the White House. Ooh. And we had the Cold War against communism. And we had a communist scare right here at home. We had the Berlin airlift. And we watched the communist war in China grow until in 1950 we saw the little country of Korea split wide open in civil war. And soon we were fighting once again, this time with the United Nations Army. Well, that was a pretty big dose of chaos for five years, wouldn't you say? Years of turbulent unrest. Years when we were looking for a normal way of life once again, but failing to find it. So it's not hard to understand, is it, why a wave of abstract art should sweep across the country and become the dominant art movement in America? Our artists of the 40s claimed that the regionalists of a decade ago had concentrated too much attention on the, the physical side of man, and they felt a need to examine his thoughts and emotions and paint their impressions of them. So this abstract art was really a search for new forms and a look way deep inside of Americans, into the subconscious, really, Another thing, abstract art was international. Artists all over the world were painting in the same style. And our artists, just as the rest of us, uh, rejected that America-only feeling after the war. So they started painting in the style of internationalism that we found in the formation of the United Nations. Well, whatever the reasons, Americans suddenly found themselves flooded with all sorts of artistic styles. I'd like to show you some of them and try to tell you uh, what the artists had in mind. Let me get a few of these prints right here. Now this is the syndicate, the work of Jack Levine. Some people disagree with his ideas, but few doubt his ability. And Louis Guglielmi began his odyssey for moderns in the early dark months of the war. It shows a featureless lost person trying to win a beachhead for tomorrow. 
And this old man in George Groats's painting, The Wanderer, represents the human spirit wandering through a dark world toward what he hopes, but does not know, will be a light and sunny day. Ben Sean's war poster, Hunger, shows a boy with face made old before its time, and an outstretched, empty hand realistically depicts the tragedy of war. And Philip Evergood is intensely concerned with what is happening to the world. His orderly retreat shows that he paints the horrors of war and the tears of the people with his very soul. Abraham Ratner's City Still Life very personally expresses his outrage at the monstrous behavior of man. Ratner maintained that an artist should be true to the emotions of his soul. Morris Graves is a realist, and his symbolic realism is what gives his very small bird singing in the moonlight its moving bravery in the lonely nighttime. Well, this abstractionism wasn't all that was happening in the art field during the 40s. Remember during the first war how so many of our artists were a part of the Creel Committee and as such were working together to produce war posters? Well, during this war, there wasn't as much organized government support. But some magnificent work was done by our artists, and many of them won their first recognition through their war work. Here, let me show you some of these posters. <coughs> many Americans first came to know Joseph Hirsch through the GIs on his war bond posters. And Harold Lehman has won fame as both a painter and a sculptor. Then Norman Rockwell's powerful posters were known throughout the land. Few people seeing them could help but respond. Well, there was something else, too. The 40s were known to our artists as the Pepsi-Cola 40s. The Pensacola Company, you see, held a nationwide contest in 1944, which drew over 5,000 entries. Now, the important thing about this was that it marked the emergence of a new patron of the arts, business. More and more large industries began commissioning artists to paint for them, began collecting famous American artworks, and this was true of the labor unions, too. The public acceptance and understanding of modern art really boomed during the 40s, and in answer to this, art museums sprang up all over the country. I've got some pictures of a couple of them right here in these prints. <coughs> yeah, misfiled as usual. <laughs> I suppose I should have them under architecture. But anyway, here they are. This one is the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. And it was established by Andrew Mellon in 1939 and its magnificent collections of art draw thousands of visitors. And this is the Cranbrook Museum of Art at Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. It was designed by Elio Saarinen as part of a whole series of buildings which comprise the Cranbrook schools. Now these buildings represent the two ends of the scale, of course. One is the classical design, and the other is of the very recent modern trend. Both were completed in the early 40s, or perhaps a little before. Howard? Oh, Howard? Uh, yes, dear? There seems to be something wrong with the water faucet. Uh-oh. Just a minute, please. Now, what was that again, dear? I said there's something wrong with the water faucet. Oh, I afraid that's what you said. Is it dripping again? Decidedly, yes. Hmm. Well, I'll have to get one of those rubber washers and fix it. In the meantime, I hope the dripping doesn't bother you too much. Oh, well, I'm not going to let it. No, I in fact, I think I'll just stage a sit-down strike right here until you do something about it. Well, in that case, in order to preserve the neutrality and maintain the peace, I'd better come up pretty soon. <laughs> I know. What are you doing, anyhow? Preparing tomorrow's lecture? No, I was just browsing through some pictures and prints of some uh, art centers. Oh, sounds interesting. What were you looking at in particular? 
Oh, uh, some of those built uh, along the early 40s. Oh, during the war? Mm, no, before. <laughs> you know, I thought maybe you'd say yes to that. Uh-uh, oh, oh, no. <laughs> uh. And as I remember, the only things built during the war were factories and homes for defense workers. Mm, well, there were other things built. But as long as you're going to stay, just sit down, strike, until I fix the faucet anyway. You might as well come down and make yourself comfortable, and we'll look at some pictures. Oh, well, you talk me right in. And you know, anyway, Howard, I, I think it will be quite some time before we get flooded out of the house. Oh, well, that reassures me. <laughs> I'll get the book on architecture. Now, you hold the book, and uh, I will uh, ad-lib a few choice comments as we go along. Oh, now you're sure this was ad-lib? Uh, well, now that you pin me down, uh, it has been done before. Mm, yes, that's just what I thought. <laughs> well, I guess I can see it better if I get it right side well, up. Well, by all <laughs> means. <laughs> oh, no, my goodness, what's this? Well, now, if you were where that couple were, you wouldn't have to worry about a dripping faucet. Oh, oh well, yes, I see it's the interior of a trailer. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness, but it does look cramped after our big kitchen upstairs. <laughs> there is a little difference, isn't there? Well, here, look at this one. Oh, well, that looks as though they weren't the only ones living in trailers. <clears throat> I was to give the comment. Oh, my, my humble apologies, my dear. Now, I'll look at the pictures and you do the talking. That's a deal. Now, this is a picture of a trailer camp mm -hmm. in the first years of the war. Mm -hmm. And even then, conditions were very overcrowded because uh, uh, the building, uh, the housing shortage was very acute around the war industry centers and the army bases. Speed became the password and temporary buildings and barracks were quickly built to house the army and navy forces overseas. And to house workers who converged on factory centers and shipyards, a new method of building known as prefabrication started. The sections of these buildings were prepared separately, and then they would be brought together and the building would take shape in a very short time. The average cost for these defense houses was from three to five thousand dollars. Over a hundred architectural firms were assigned housing projects. Now some of these houses were more permanently planned and adapted to the surrounding areas, while other farms were developed to be used on a more temporary basis. As for instance, the Quonset hut. And you know, Esther, many times the native materials and woods were used to build these small homes. Oh, oh, that was very interesting, Howard, very. Mm -hmm. Did you notice one thing? I kept quiet. It was appreciated. <laughs> but I do have a question to ask, though. Well, let's have it. Well, now, with all the factories and, and uh, these uh, homes for defense workers being built so quickly, did the architects have time to do anything in the way of planning? Oh, yes. All during the war, there was a lot of planning in, in anticipation of future needs. Oh. Well, yes, I suppose they did do a lot of thinking about what they would like to build after the war. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, even during the war, there were many things built that were quite worthy of note. Mm -hmm. Here, let's look at a few more pictures. Now, you watch the pictures, and, and I'll make, make the comments. Yes, uh -huh. <laughs> I guess we understand each other, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, Howard, if we don't after all these years, when will we? Well, <laughs> for that, you may tweak my teeth. Oh, the flavor. <laughs> now, let's get on with this nonsense here. Now, where, where were we? Oh, let's well, get let's on see, with now, pictures. you were uh, telling about uh, the works of the leading architects uh, before and during oh, and after the war. yes, mm -hmm. yes, that's right. Well, thank you for bringing me up yes. to date. Now, on with the pictures. Now, the new building shapes taking place were particularly significant. In Racine, Wisconsin, Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture was shown in his Johnson Wax Company buildings. The walls were brick, lined with cork and concrete, and sealed against fire, noise, and dirt. And the heating of the space inside was synchronized with the movement of the sun. 
but challenging right for world leadership in architecture was Elio Saarinen. In collaboration with other architects, he designed the Des Moines Art Center, whose buildings show simplicity of line and a balanced spatial relationship. In Chicago, Mies van der Rohe built his first buildings in the United States at the Illinois Institute of Technology. And this is the Terrace Plaza Hotel in Cincinnati, designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Sculpture, painting, and architecture are integrated to make it a structure of beauty. The late 1940s saw the headquarters of the United Nations being built on Manhattan's east side. New methods of construction came about during these post-war years, and the UN building was not to be excluded. Well, well, no, Howard, I shouldn't think that it would. In fact, uh, we not only shouldn't exclude the building, but we shouldn't exclude the UN itself. Well, words of wisdom, my dear, words of wisdom. You know, I almost feel tempted to tweak your oh, cheek. Oh, now kindly restrain <laughs> yourself. You know, right now I'd rather hear more about the United Nations. Okay. Do you recall the uh, uh, conference in San Francisco in 1945 when the charter was signed? Oh, yes. Everyone was filled with hope and optimism. But my, uh, what a short time it lasted. Yes, how sadly true. The UN ran into problems right off the bat. Well, and America was having her share of problems, too. Oh, yes, that's true. In fact, I was thinking about that just a little bit ago. All the things that were happening to us right after the war there. Do you remember that rash of strikes? That oh, broke my up? goodness, yes. It seemed like everything was happening in labor. There were coal strikes, steel strikes, telephone strikes. And you know, Howard, it just seemed that every time labor asked for and uh, got an increase in wages, why, our prices went up. Yes, that's just what happened. Of course, it was all part of a cycle, you see. After the war this time, we didn't just plunge off into a depression. We just kept blithely spending. <laughs> Yes, and you know the way they took the price controls off everything except rent. Well, it's no wonder the things were expensive. That's right, but of course it affected labor the same way. They had to pay the same prices as everyone else, so they just struck for more money. Yes, and when they got it, well, their employer just simply added that uh, increase to the mm -hmm. cost of his product. And, well, so we were off on a gay little inflationary <laughs> ride. <laughs> you realize that in 1947, that food prices were double what they were in 39? Oh, statistics. <laughs> but those really, Howard, I can appreciate. Well, there was good cause for our, us as a nation doing spending all this money. We were fighting a cold war. Well, yes, and then it took a lot of money to uh, operate that Marshall Plan and uh, the Lend-Lease activities. Yes. And America was trying to hold back communism all over the world. All over the world? Well, how about right here at home? Remember all those investigations that started right after the war? Do I remember them? Listen, I am a college professor. Mm -hmm. I may be next. Oh, Howard, really? No, now, right now, <laughs> at this point, I insist on a change of subject and scenery. Very well, my dear. Shall we be seat ourselves upon yon couch? I'm sure it will be very soft. Oh, well, I know it'll be much more comfortable than this old chair. Fine. Someday I'm going to get you a new chair, Howard. That one kind of needs a little restuffing or something. <laughs> now, do you want a pillow? A pillow? No, the old horse hair will do adequately. Now, what would you like to talk about? Me? <clears throat> now, what would you like to talk about? Oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> that's better. You know, that's almost my favorite subject. Oh, even more than America and her art? Oh, naturally. <laughs> but then you have shamed me. So we shall proceed to America and her arts. Oh, now, such as? Such as uh, theater. Oh, fine. Now, now let me uh, rack my brain and see if I can't think of something to contribute to this conversation. Now, uh, theater. Hmm. Well, the theater was certainly doing all right during the war, wasn't it? Oh, yes. The cities were crowded with war workers, had a lot of money to spend, and mm -hmm. the ticket prices soared. Soon it was quite normal to see long, long lines of people waiting to buy tickets. Well, it sounds like a happy time for the theater. Well, it was, but it, it didn't last very long. See, right after the war, the theater was facing the very serious competition of television. Mm -hmm. And they've been fighting for their financial life ever since. Well, what type of plays were they doing on Broadway then? 
All war plays, I suppose. Well, there were a lot of them, of course. I imagine that the, the most successful was Irving Berlin's uh, This is the Army. Oh. You know, the entire cast was composed of servicemen. Oh, well, that was just like his yip, yip, yap hang. <laughs> yes, Didn't very much. The uh -huh. first uh -huh. Of course, there were a lot of other plays, too, war plays. There was uh, The Winged Victory and Mr. Roberts and The Command Decision and Watch on the Rhine. Oh, those were wonderful plays as I remember them. Yes, very good plays. You see, there wasn't the rush to just get anything about the war onto the stage uh, like we had after the first war. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we had better plays. A lot of fine musicals, too. <laughs> well, you know, with all the servicemen on leave, there was a big audience for, well, just any show that was fun. Mm. And that just described the musicals. Mm. They kind of dominated the theatrical world during the 1940s. Well, I should say they did. How do you remember the wonderful songs mm. in Oklahoma? Oh, yes. Yeah, now there was one popular oh, musical. Yes. Mm. It made the ballet quite popular, too, that show. Oh, oh, there were some beautiful dancers in it. Well, no wonder. Agnes DeMille did the choreography. Oh, that's right. Well, mm -hmm. She's a very important person in the history of modern ballet, isn't she? Very much so. Mm. You see, she proved that the, the choreography, that is, the dance part of the show, mm -hmm. could bring out the plot and carry the story along. Oh, but isn't that what ballet has done right long? Well, to an extent, but not to the limits reached in Oklahoma. Oh. Now, that was one show, along with many others, that showed how the the dancer and the writer and the producer could blend their arts into a successful production. Hmm. Well, I can see how there would need to be a lot of cooperation in producing Oklahoma. You know, those great big square dances and ballets, but they took up almost the entire stage. Yeah. Hey, speaking of uh, DeMille, didn't she do the choreography for other successful musicals during the 40s? Oh, yes. And this was about the time that the ballet theater was established oh, in New yeah, York. Yeah very important development in American ballet. She did a lot of the dances for that group, too. You know, we're just talking about Agnes DeMille. And the little bird told me that there were some very uh, successful male dancers about that time. Hmm. The little bird told you? <laughs> well, whatever it was. <laughs> but anyhow, I do remember uh, Jerome Robbins about that time. Well, you have some very accurate informants, <laughs> feathered or otherwise. <laughs> and did they also tell you that he, pr he produced uh, Fancy Free? And that uh, <coughs> Michael Kidd became very distinguished as a choreographer when he produced his uh, on stage. Oh, well, no, my little birds don't uh, go into a lot of detail. Oh. No, no, they didn't mention anything about uh, movie dancing, social dancing, nothing except stage ballet. Oh, my. <laughs> Have you talked to the bees about this? <laughs> Oh, no, no, not the bees. <laughs> well, they would have assured you that the jitterbugs had their heyday, that after the war, the square dances swept the country, and then uh, Latin American dances became very popular, not to mention the revival of the Charleston oh, and the... Oh, oh, you don't need to go so fast, dear. Now, now, what were you saying about uh, dancing in the movie? I didn't say. Oh, well, good, then I didn't miss anything. <laughs> <laughs> what I would have said, however, was that the late 1940s, uh, saw the introduction of these big uh, movie ballets. Good heavens, Howard. What's the matter? I forgot all about the faucet. It's still oh. dripping. Well, it's lucky I didn't put the stopper in the sink. We'd be floating around by this time. Maybe we should call the Iowa Navy and get some uh, life preservers <laughs> up here. I've forgotten how to swim. <laughs> <laughs> well, so long as you know how to repair the sink, that, or the faucet in the sink, that's all I ask. Okay. Now, will you come up soon? Very soon, I just have to get some more notes together uh, for my final exam next week, and then I'll be right up. Okay, but if that faucet gets to dripping too loud again, I'm going to call you. You just give me the old SOS, and I'll be right there. <laughs> Bye now. I've been looking through some notes here on the movies of the 1940s. Remember, I told Esther that the movie industry had done quite a bit toward making the ballet popular. But it was doing a lot more than that in the 1940s, as it had been doing since its beginnings. The movie industry was commenting on the times, trying to help man understand the world in which he lived. Now, I say that with some qualifications, of course, because there were a great many movies made which were just used as a means of escape from social problems for people. And many of the social problems were misrepresented and sentimentalized. But there's no doubt about the power of the movies held in the 1940s. The films could start new styles and fads, set up new attitudes, and be used as propaganda, too. They were a very useful device for our armed services. Here, I have a picture here. 
Look at this one. Look at these fellows. The moving picture was a common device for building the morale of our soldiers overseas. And very often the troops sat in the open like this, maybe in a driving rain watching a film of someone choking in the desert. Well, uh, many of these guys had come to service from service schools where films were used to train them to do everything from firing a gun to overcoming malaria, fire, or fear. And on the home front, people working in defense plants had to be taught how to operate unfamiliar machines, and the movies just fit in fine for that purpose. And the makers of documentary films did much to aid the war effort, too. Several pictures were made. Often they were used as a means of controlling and directing public opinion. I compiled a little list of them here. I'm going to use them in that final exam if I ever get it ready for next week. Here. Why We Fight was made to be shown to soldiers. And Bomber had a running commentary written by Carl Sandburg. The documentary at its very best was shown in uh, Louis de Rochemont's and uh, Edward Steichen's picture, The Fighting Lady. This was the story of an aircraft carrier. Then the army released Memphis Belle, a movie about a flying fortress in action. Well, these are just some of the more noteworthy ones. Then when the war was finished and the boys started coming home, the movies turned to the readjustment problem the boys faced. And one such movie was called The Best Years of Our Lives. Remember that? Toward the close of the decade, America saw a group of films dealing with psychological melodrama. You may recall such titles as Spellbound and uh, Snake Pit. Well, let's get on with our discussion of the trends in movie making. After the war, the movies went right along with the uh, inflation ride. But then a threat loomed over the movie industry, the same threat that was hanging over radio. And you probably guessed I was referring to television. Now, this industry was, as you might imagine, quite a novelty at first. And here was the appeal of sight and sound right in the privacy of your own living room. And that could cause quite an impact. But television in the 1940s was still new. Techniques needed to be improved as to programming and presentation before the new element could take its place as an art form. Well, that just about completes my notes. Up to date. Guess I'm almost set to prepare that final test for the semester. It's going to be a tough one, too. Well, right now, though, I believe Esther is waiting patiently, more or less, up there for my plumbing abilities to blossom forth. But how long she's going to tolerate that leaky faucet in the sink. So I'd better gather me up some pipe wrenches and get up there and get at it.